You're watching Capital Connection from the Illinois State Capitol. A retired Marine Corps officer and former state senator Paul Schimpf announced this week he's jumping into the race for governor, declaring as a Republican in the primary. He joins us now from his campaign office in Waterloo. Senator Schimpf, good to have you with us. Thanks for having me on, Mark. You cast yourself as a bit of a centrist on union issues. I don't know that unions agree with you. The AFL-CIO gave you about a 30% rating or so uh, on their scorecard. Uh, that was among some of the higher ranks for Republicans, but really nowhere near voting with unions even half the time. How can you make that claim that you're uh, union friendly? Well, I'm a centrist on union issues. Uh, both my parents were public school teachers and union members. You know, I stood with the uh, unions in Illinois uh, against tremendous pressure from the Rauner administration, both in the controversy about some of the state nurses that the Rauner administration wanted to fire, and then also on uh, right to work issues. So I'm not gonna I'm not gonna vote with the unions 100% of the time. That's what my constituents expect. Uh, is they expected me to uh, vote if I with the unions if I thought they were right or vote against them if I thought they were wrong. So you know that's uh, that's the position that I that I have. Uh, I don't think unions are the enemy. I think unions do a lot of good work. I think they are part of the solution for Illinois. What did you make of the Janus versus AFSCME case? I thought that Janice was wrongly de wrongly decided. In fact, I had uh, fire filed a uh, a motion, you know, in favor of the union in that in that case. Very interesting. So, give us a, an idea what that looks like. Uh, it's been a while since uh, Illinois has had a. Pro would you describe yourself as pro union? You said sort of centrist. How do you just describe yourself on these issues? I would say I'm a centrist on union issues. I simply. Yeah. You know, I think that unions play a positive force for good. When when I think they are they are right, I will agree with them. For instance, I am opposed to right to work. Uh, but when I think they are wrong, for instance, when the unions heavily pushed for an increase in the minimum wage for Illinois teachers, I voted against that. So I'm just somebody that is going to uh, objectively evaluate proposals with an open mind. And if I think it's going to be good for the state, I will support it. If I think it's going to be bad for the state, I'll be against it. I assume by now you've seen the response from the Illinois Democratic County Chairs Association and the Illinois Democratic Party, both of them casting you as uh, Rauner 2.0 or friendly to Governor Rauner's agenda. I did. I did see that. And I noticed that, you know, they didn't dispute any of the points that I made about the change in direction that the uh, that the state needs to go. Uh, usually when somebody only can only result in name calling, that's a tacit admission that they know that you're right. So, uh, you know, look, if, if they want to resort to that, that's fine. You know, we're going to run a, uh, you know, an aggressive campaign. I'm going to campaign all over the state. I'm going to be spending at least half my time in Chicago, but we're going to be talking about the issues. We're not going to be name calling, but we are going to aggressively point out where Governor Pritzker has made mistakes. It's interesting. I'm digging in on the union side because that was for many years the playbook for a Republican to win statewide elected office was uh, to have sort of a labor backing uh, from some of the trades or some of the unions, also uh, the social conservatives uh, and sort of what you might call the country club Republicans, some of the white collar uh, corporate Republicans uh, in, in the uh, suburb area. Uh, and that was sort of a winning coalition for many years. But uh, so perhaps the dynamics have changed. Uh, we'll see. President Trump was someone who successfully got uh, the labor backing or a lot of labor backing at the very least, if not from the brass, many of the were rank and file in 2016 that helped him win uh, the White House. Of course, he did not win here in Illinois, but he did excite some of those same voters. What's your message to Trump voters today? Well, my message is don't leave the don't leave the Republican Party. Think about, you know, what we want a Republican Party to stand for. You know, I had spent um, most of my adult life in the Marine Corps. Uh, during that time, one of the secretaries of defense was a guy named Don Rumsfeld. And Rumsfeld uh, is famous for a quote where he said, you go to war with the army you've got, you know, not the army that you want. You know, and there are things about the Republican Party that frustrate me, but really it only is the Republican Party that can bring change to Illinois. It's the Republican Party that is going to be able to adv advocate for 
responsible government, safe communities, and economic growth through the free market. So, you know, even though no political party is perfect, I would really urge the uh, supporters of former President Trump to stay in the Republican Party and try to make it stronger because that's how we can change direction in Illinois. What should be the role of President Trump in the Republican Party moving forward? Oh my goodness, I have not been following what he is, what he has been up to, just because uh, we have enough challenges uniting. Well, the let, let me fill you in. Just, just I'll, I'll fill you in on what he's been up to. Just recently, this week, upon the death of Rush Limbaugh, he appeared on Fox News on a phone call and again stated that he won the election in a big way. Well, I don't think I don't think he won the election. That's you know that's you know we, the system that we have. Uh, he did not. He did not win. He had his day. He had his day in court. Uh, I did vote for President Trump both in 2016 and 2020. I don't do not regret that vote at all. Uh, but I think what we need to be doing is instead of uh, you know fighting with fellow Republicans, we need to be laying out a positive agenda for you know why people should support the Illinois Republican Party and how we can change Illinois and make Illinois go back to the point where this is the strongest state in the country. You said you didn't regret that. Even after the events that unfolded on January 6th, you would have yet again voted for President Trump? Well, the, the choice in, 20, in the 2020 election, Mark, was not so much a choice between two candidates. It was a choice between uh, two different visions for the United States of America. Uh, the vision that President Biden was uh, was proposing was an America with an expansive government, an America, you know, that really is one that he wants to govern through exe executive orders. Uh, you know, you look at what President Biden has done so far, I vehemently disagree uh, with how he is trying to run the country. I don't think President Trump would have been issuing, what is it now, is it it's, it's something like, are we up to like about 80 executive orders or is it even more than that? Uh, so I don't regret my votes in 2016 and 2020. Very interesting. You've criticized Governor Pritzker, calling him a catastrophic failure. Uh, what would you have done differently in fighting the coronavirus? Well, you know, we could be talking about this for an entire an entire hour, but uh, or a full campaign all the way up to 2022. Exactly. Probably the biggest mistake that Governor Pritzker has made is he has not partnered with the Illinois General Assembly. He has the General Assembly didn't show up to work. He could he could have called a special session. Are you telling me, Mark, that that the governor, if he had had a meeting with Speaker Madigan and President Harmon, that he couldn't have gotten them to come in and at least cleared up the ambiguity that existed with his executive authority? He did. I mean, he I'm actually not, did. Really, he stood, he stood in a press conference. That. We could roll the tape. He stood in a press conference and ordered them to get back to work. He said they need to come back. He did not use his authority to call a special session. You're right, but he, he basically said, even if I did that, there's no guarantee they would show up because of the coronavirus concerns. Well, that's kind of a, that's a pretty damning indictment of his leadership ability. He's, the, uh, he's the, the leader of the Illinois Democratic Party and he could not even convince uh, President Harmon and Speaker Madigan to come in for an abbreviated session. You know, that's one of the things that I'm going to be running on is Governor Pritzker has failed as a leader. You look at the the uh, hugely inappropriate partisan speech that he just gave in the state of the state address. Uh, the, the fact is, Governor Pritzker is not a leader. You know, in addition to a budget deficit, we have a leadership deficit in Illinois. And the fact that he could not even get Speaker Madigan and President Harmon to come into session. What does that what does that say about him as his leadership abilities, Mark? What is the state of the state, if you had a word or a sentence? Deteriorating. Uh, the thing that, you know, the, the most damning statistic that exists out there right now is the fact that over the past year, we have lost nearly 80,000 people. Our net population loss from July of 19 to July of 2020 was nearly 80,000 people. And the reason that's important is we cannot solve any of our long-term challenges, whether it's education, whether it's pensions, we cannot solve any of those things until Illinois is a state where people want to come and raise their families and grow their businesses. And for Governor Pritzker to not even mention that statistic during his state of the state speech, not level with the people of Illinois, not try to give an explanation for why people are leaving our state in droves, that's dereliction of duty.
honestly, you know, he talked in his speech about how he was being honest with the people of Illinois. Well, how can you be on? How can you say you're honest with the people of Illinois when you don't bother even mentioning that people are that there is a mass exodus going on from our state right now? Mm -hmm. uh, you sat on the Joint Committee on Administrative Rules when that panel, which is a powerful rulemaking committee, uh, uh, des designated uh, with pretty wide power here in Springfield, when that panel uh, gave Governor Pritzker the legal authority to fine businesses if they didn't enforce a mask mandate or some other coronavirus restrictions. Uh, one of your colleagues who just joined the Senate as a Republican, Darren Bailey, is widely expected to jump into this race to run against you to become the nominee for, for governor. Many in our audience will recognize him because he took those fights to court. Uh, how will you distinguish yourself from someone like Senator Bailey, who might have more name recognition in, in that lane that fought against the coronavirus restrictions? Well, first of all, you know, I welcome the competition. You know, I view this Republican primary as the equivalent of a high school basketball tryout. I think that we are all on the same team. We are just trying to see who's got the best skill set to be the starting point guard and be the one that represents our party against uh, J.B. Pritzker in the fall of 2022. So I do welcome uh, the competition. I think other people uh, will probably get in as, as well. Uh, the way that I would distinguish myself is I would just say, you know, look at my record, look at my background. I think that for any Republican to beat J.B. Pritzker, I think that Republican is going to have to do three things. I think the first thing you're going to have to do is you've got to re reunite the uh, fractured Illinois Republican Party. I think you also need to give the voters a contrast between yourself and Governor Pritzker. And it needs to be not just a policy contrast but also a life story contrast. And then the third thing that you have to do as a Republican to win statewide in Illinois is you have to be able to get crossover votes. You know, I'm gonna uh, tell the, vote, the Republican voters of Illinois that I'm the person that can do those three things. I got a lot of crossover votes when I ran against Lisa Madigan back in 2014. We didn't have much resources, but we were able to flip 44 counties that had previously voted for Lisa Madigan in 2010, we flipped them to vote for me. You need about 101. What's that? You're going to need about 101 counties. <laughs> True. But uh, and then in, uh, in the 2016 election, I was running against former Lieutenant Governor Sheila Simon, you know, and I was I was out spinning that in that race. But we won that race decisively in my Senate district you know, is a very uh, diverse district, a lot of, uh, lot of different equities. Uh, you have a progressive community down in Carbondale. You have a lot of union workers with state facilities. You have some very conservative areas. So I represented a district with a lot of different equities, you know, much like the state of Illinois. And I won that district overwhelmingly in 2016. So I do think I'm the best candidate that the Republicans have. Mm -hmm. The Democrats attacked you and said you were opposed to science. I, I, I assume they were talking about the, the coronavirus restrictions here. Uh, Senator Bailey, who may uh, announce a run for governor as well, has said he's not sure. Uh, he doesn't see conclusive evidence if a mask works to slow or stop the spread of the coronavirus. What do you think? Well, I've been wearing a mask since uh, since March, uh, really, you know, long before there were mask mandates. I think I think you need to wear a mask if for no other reason then you know a mask will reduce your exposure dosage you know and there have been studies that have shown that you know if the exposure dosage is low the uh, the effects of the illness are much less severe but you know if you it's ironic that the gov that the democrats would say that i'm anti-science because governor pritzker is the one that when he announced uh, his mitigation plan uh back on july 15th that was based on the positivity rate he went on to answer a question in a press conference and indicated he clearly did not understand how the positivity rate works. You can go back and watch it yourself. You don't have to take my word for it. It was his July 15th press conference. But Governor Pritzker at that time did not understand the positivity rate. And the reason that was such a problem is he was basing his mitigation plan on that metric. This was a metric that he was using to shut down businesses and destroy livelihoods, and he didn't even understand how it works. You know, that's just the epitome of failed leadership right there. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, real quickly before we let you go, in his State of the State and budget address, the governor said he wants to protect our nuclear fleet in any new energy legislation. Uh, many of our viewers are watching in horror as they see the blackouts in Texas, people living in below freezing temperatures in that state without access to power or electricity in their own homes. Um, I, Texas is a unique situation. We don't expect that to happen on a wide scale here in Illinois, but there is uh, an energy discussion on the horizon. How would you approach it? What should be the proper path forward? And what's the role of nuclear in our energy grid? Well, I'm an all of the above guy when it comes to energy. And one of the things that I was very concerned about in some of these uh, renewable energy proposals that were going forward is they were saying that they wanted to have Illinois only using renewable power, I think by 2035 or some day 2050. Very, very close, close coming up. But if you look at where our power comes from right now, uh, a lot of our power is, is either uh, coal-fired or natural gas, it's fossil fuels. And we have to make sure well, and that nuclear. we don't have, we, we can't have a situation in, in, in Texas where we don't have the capacity to meet our energy needs, you know, if the renewables uh, are not running. It, well, in Texas, it was very clearly because they couldn't, uh, their natural gas and those, those uh, wells were, were frozen over. They couldn't draw the natural gas out. It wasn't a renewable problem. Right, but if, but if you have, but you also have to, you know, that the, the principle is, you know, if one source of energy goes away, do you have enough to cover that gap if there right. is one? And, you know, if we're going to plan on having all of our energy come via uh, wind power, you know, in, in cold conditions, wind turbines can uh, stop working. So we need to be prepared for that. You asked about nuclear energy. I think nuclear energy is. Uh, part of the solution. I think we do need to have uh, nuclear power because it is so reliable. All right, Senator Paul Schiff joining us from his campaign office in Waterloo. Thanks for joining us and we'll stay tuned throughout the rest of this campaign. Thanks a lot, Mark. Really enjoyed the discussion. All right, we're back in just a moment.